Well, and here's one of the things I have to say about the book, because I, I don't even know how long we know each other now. It's got to be, it's at least 15 years. I can remember 2005, 2006 being with you guys in Vegas uh, when you played the joint at the Hard Rock. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you let me play your guitar on the stage. Right, yeah, that was 2006, I think. Yeah, so so it's at least 15 years because we yeah. knew each other before that. So in that time, you and I have talked a lot of stories, and I've specifically asked you about business. So you are a friend and a business mentor for sure. So picking up the book as a bizoir was definitely very interesting to me to see what was in there. And the thing that I think was fascinating, I think when people read it, that they're going to like is that as you tell the stories, it's not just like, okay, this is what you should do for business. It's like, okay, this is the idea of why this is good for business. And here's how I came to that through the experience in my life. And you tell them the stories and your twisted method going down through all those things is not just necessarily strictly for business. It's a good life plan. Yeah. You know? So you, you got it all together, and you know I can imagine the editing process was a nightmare. <laughs> no, if it wasn't for Steve, it wouldn't have gotten done. Yeah. Steve is an accomplished author and a best-selling author, and a very smart guy, and he can hear my voice. And this is an important story. You know, you read some books and you go, eh, I read, the, I read the Keith Richards book. It sounded like Keith was talking to me. I know that he wasn't, but it was so well right. done that I felt like I got to know Keith. I really got to know Keith through his book in a way that I never thought I would. And I said, damn, whoever wrote that book with him was a genius because it sounds like Keith. He's uh. sitting there and he's talking to you. And I, I said to Steve, I need my humor, my sense of irony, my, my sense of the ridiculous to come out as well as the information. And he was able to do that. And that's uh. why I didn't write it on my own because I didn't think I could be that objective. And I didn't want to make a book that wasn't read readable. Right. And I'm a writer, which is even weirder. It's like, I am a professional writer. I write for magazines. So you would think you're a professional writer. Why do you need a, a writer? Because my stories are so broad and crazy that I needed a filter. And not just an editor, not just a managing editor for the book, you know, yeah. a copy editor. Right. I needed a guy, I need a substance editor. And Steve Farber is a, was my substance editor. He'd never done that before. By the yeah. way. Oh, okay. And he became my partner. And what I talk about in the book is I talk about the importance of partnerships. You know, I don't do this alone. Man, if it wasn't for Dee and Mark and Eddie, I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. There's no way I'd be sitting here. Yeah. I mean, I'm only here because of the cumulative efforts of all those people. And I recognize that. I, I don't sit there and go, it's me. I go, you know, there's we. And that D represented this and Mark represented that. In fact, all the old, even the original guys, without any of them, yeah. there's no story, right? right? So I can't even build on the lessons I learned without the some of the idiots I dealt with in the past who <laughs> put me through shit that I learned a great lesson from, you know? What's that phrase, you know, there but for the grace of God, God go yeah. I, right? So thank you for being such assholes and so <laughs> fucked up and my ability to survive your stupidity and your assholeism taught me great lessons, you know, and I think that's probably the case with any successful business person. Yeah. You know, you didn't you don't just shoot out of the box. Although today people think, you know, you have a hit record and you make a perfume and you make a billion dollars and that's the wrong I'm not gonna say it's the wrong thing. I think it's crazy to think that that is the way to do it. Yeah. Some people have succeeded and it's almost like winning the lottery because it really doesn't happen to too many people. Right. But if you're doing that, if you're creating music just to be the foundation for your sneaker company because that's what you think you want, which is a crazy thing. Instead yeah. of getting the music down right, man, I, I don't operate that way. Yeah. I don't. And I think you need to have a great foundation and a basis with which to jump from it. And if the band's um, ongoing concerns, as you know, we became a licensing giant, right. but nobody knew that. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that 50 years ago, I would even know what the word licensing means. I mean, I go marriage license, yeah. taxi license, what driver's license, like what, what's a license? But at least, you, you know, know, it was very interesting that you cover in the book going to court and retaining the rights to Twisted System. Yeah, well that was, in the, in the W part of the book, which is wisdom, you know, that was a really, Man, talk about like an out-of-body experience. You know, here, here I am 
filing for bankruptcy, going through a divorce, like all the things that normally would drive people crazy, but I had already almost committed suicide 15 years earlier, so this was kind of like <laughs> nothing. Not like, this, this wasn't that a big deal, you know, like, people say, how'd you handle it? The band went, you went bankrupt, your, your wife left you, and you had a heart, thing. yeah, but I already went through like, my wife left me, the band broke up, and, and my mom died, so I already went through that, and I, I knew I could survive it. But I was at my soon-to-be in-laws, second wife's house, watching this, watching TV in England, and watching a Tide commercial or some commercial, and they use the song Stand By Me as the mm. music. And I remember thinking, you know, in, in England, everything is very stylized. You know, when they do Mars Bar commercials, the Mars Bars look amazing. Like, they really just do it in England. Yeah. Like, and England's a very small market. It's like the size of New York State. You know, yeah. so if, if you're big in England, everybody knows you're big. So I'm watching this commercial, and it was, I think, a Tide detergent. And it's so typical, you know, it's this really good looking guy, goes to a laundromat, you know, and he has to wash his t shirt, and he pulls it off, he's ripped, and this girl's like, oh, you know, sees it. Yeah. And, and I think Stand By Me was playing. And I'm thinking, wow, it's kind of cool they used the song from 1961. I mean, it's 1961. This is 1989. Well, the song goes to number one because the record label who owned the rights realized that people love this commercial and figured, right. let's give it a shot. And next thing you know, it goes to number one. Only in England can something like that crazy happen. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, man, music and commercials. That's what I th thought I said. Music and commercials. I love that. What a great, what a great concept. So I come home. Father bankruptcy, in bankruptcy court, that day was one of the toughest days of my life. I'm sitting there, and this judge looks at me and he says, and I explain why I'm in bankruptcy court. You can read it in the book. Yeah. I have to leave something for you. Yeah, guys. absolutely. That's <laughs> so, <laughs> Which, by the way, well, we can. Let's just, you can read it in the book. Yeah. And by the way, if you're having trouble seeing, <laughs> how's this? This is this is the book of people who are who are vision impaired. Okay, we leave no stone unturned. Just in case you need case big you print. Right, wait till you see the pages on this thing. Oh, this thing weighs so much. So, um, so anyway, uh, the judge says, "Why shouldn't I take the name away from yeah. you?" And I went because it's worthless. Now it may sound ridiculous, but it was worthless. We went from being uber great and hot to being absolutely worthless in about a second and a half mm. where nobody cared and I said the name is worthless I said but I said you know who knows in 10 years Tide Detergent may want to use one of our songs to, to for a commercial and I said and if that happens I don't want the ability to put the band back together because if that happens maybe the band will reunite and if that happens maybe I will have been married with a child and if that happens maybe I want money to send my kid to college so if you let me keep the name I may be able someday to make enough money to send a baby that I don't have yet to college. And that's what I said. And I said, even though to and he said to me, why is it yesterday's news? And I said to the judge, well, I said, okay, so you know who Twisted Sister is for sure mm -hmm. on TV. I said, how many times do you hear about a movie costing a hundred million bucks comes out and it bombs? He goes, it happens. I said, yeah, biggest name, biggest director, bombs. Public doesn't matter. How many times a Broadway show open? Huge. 30 million, 30 million dollar book, and everything. Yeah. biggest actors, and it bombs. Happens all the time. I said, we made a record, we banked on it, and it bombed. I said, we didn't want it to bomb, but it fell apart, and it precipitated the band falling apart. Yeah. I said, because it happens, and nobody likes it to happen, but it happens. And he, at me. he was really fascinated. Okay, all right. Now, Joe, <coughs> this is the absolute truth. 10 years to the month of that claim that mm -hmm. I made, Comtrex nasal spray license we're not going to take for a hundred thousand dollars. First license we got post breakup because yeah. we've been in movies in the eighties. But um, um, and that proceeded and that then led to the yeah. unbelievable amount of licensing which happens today. And then we re-recorded the song so we can keep one hundred percent of the money after that. So yeah, but again, um, that was an incredibly smart, lucky analysis. Yeah. And a presentation to a judge that was cogent and not crazy, right? Plausibly plausible enough, and he bought it, which was true, and it all happened. So, um, I am really proud of that moment. But I tell you, when I walked out of bankruptcy court, all I had left was one guitar and two subway tokens, mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. I had the apartment um, because my parents had a rent control apartment, so I did have that. But I had yeah. no job; I had no money. And I went up to my uh, stepmother's house, and she gave me a, a credit card, her Amex card with my name on it. 
because yeah. I had lost everything. She said, here, you have this. And then um, a friend of mine who owned a gym chain offered me a job to work overnights for cash if I would help him manage his nephew. And I, th I said to him, okay, but you know, I'm working overnights in a pool hall, which is already tough yeah. to handle when you're coming from an exalted position of being you know, on MTV and a superstar. Yeah. And he said to me, listen, anyone asks you why you're here, tell me you're an owner. And I went, totally cool. You cool this 100%? He said, yeah, me and Jimmy own this place. So as far as they know, you're on a pool hall, great. Yeah. You have owned a million things. You know, pool hall, you're working over, you know, you're hanging out at pool hall. So he did. Gave me a safe face, yeah. worked at the pool hall, and we signed his nephew. And his nephew got a record deal really quick, and we did okay for the first couple of years, and then and then it fell apart, and uh, I tried to sign other bands, and it fell apart, it yeah. fell apart, fell apart, and then I got a job selling stereo. And my daughter was born, and I got a job selling stereo. Now that was, talk about a humbling experience. Selling stereos from a store that I used to buy my stereos from, now it was a very high end store, so yeah. again, you could make a case, JJ owned, you know, but I couldn't say that JJ owned Lyric. Yeah. So I kind of went undercover there, didn't ever talk about my life. And when I had to go to people's houses to look at their setups on Park Avenue, I had to go through the back doors because <laughs> I'm the help. Quote, the help. Yeah. So I'd show up at Park Avenue and I'd go over Lyric High Fi and they go, please use the back yeah. elevator. Now, I have to tell you, that's a little hard, you know? But I had remarried, I had a kid. And you, know, you, you have like, to do what you, you have to do. do what you, you have to do what you have to do, you know? So I would go to their houses and I would see my, my records sometimes <laughs> in their kids' rooms. Or whatever, yeah. And I, I never said a word. I didn't want to get into one yeah. of those, like, why are you here? You know what I mean? You can right. just, like, dwell and call that right. shit up. So, no, I wouldn't ever talk about it. But, you know, it's, it's and one of the things that's covered in the book, too, is the way you turned it all around, though. And, and one of the, actually, one of the things that we've spoken about on a few occasions that I was surprised that didn't show up in a book, because I was expecting is a bizwar on the business end of it, but I would have heard the Harley Davidson story. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I may have, I may have um, told it to Steve, and it just didn't make the book. But yeah. there's so many attempts to use the, the trademark, and one of them, and I had to sue everybody. You know, I had yeah. to keep suing people because I had the trademark. And uh, I got a phone call one day from a guy representing Harley Davidson, or so he said, a lawyer from West yeah. Virginia, and he said, you know, he said, we want to name a tire Twisted Sister, and we did our due diligence and found out you on the trademark, and we're calling to let, to let you know we're going to use the name, and we're going to call the tire Twisted Sister. And I said to him, are you really just calling me to tell me you're violating my trademark? <laughs> like, I, I couldn't, I, I, I was like dumbfounded. I, I said, um, you're really calling me up, telling me you acknowledge I own the trademark. You're telling me... You don't care that I own the trademark because you're Harley Davidson with four hundred million dollars worth of assets, and then you're gonna call a tire Twisted Sister, and you're gonna send me a couple of tires as like a thank you. And that's what you're saying to me, right? And he says, "Yeah." And I said, "Give me your numbers." And he takes his number down, and I hang up the phone. And I'm just like, live my fucking life. And um, I call him back half hour later, and this is what I said. I said, "Hey, man, JJ Frank." I said. You know, um, you know the phone number you called to reach me is a 212 number. He goes, yeah. I said, you know what that means, don't you? He goes, I'm a New York guy. In fact, I'm a New York Jew. That's why I said that. I said, so this is exactly how this is going to go down. He said, number one, I sued Six Flags and won. He went, what? I said, yeah, and they're twice as big as Harley Davidson. And I took them to court for three years, and I won. Did you do the due diligence on that? He said, uh, no, I didn't. I said, well, you should do due diligence on that because I also took Urban Decay down. And I said, so this is how it's going to go down. If you fuck me like this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sign a band and call them the Harley Davidsons. I'm going to send you a couple of guitar picks as a fucking thank you. And he said, how much do you want? And I said, I want 10% and two fat boys a year. 
I only knew that because Mark. Cause yeah. I, I didn't know because I don't write. So when he says Mark, he means Mark the Animal Mendoza, a bass player from Twisted Sister. And Biker. Just make sure I'm covering it. Absolutely. And, he and I have written and, before. And, 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 and I called Mark. I went, son of a bitch, of Harley Davidson called me anymore. <laughs> fuck that word. Yo, you can hear Mark. Like, what the fuck does he think he like? You know, I'm thinking, man, this is like crazy shit. Mark goes, tell me about two fat boys. I said, that's a motorcycle. <laughs> Panhead fat boys. Shovel heads, right? All this yes, shit. Yes, right? yeah. So you guys know that shit. Me, I know Schwinn. I know that's only bikes I know. I don't know fucking bikes. So I go, I want two fat boys and ten percent. And and I hung up on him. And he called me back the next day. He said we rescinded our uh, our, our use of the name, and that was the end of that. But yeah, and you know the fact I'm a New York Jew. Look, it's histrionic stuff for sure. It's exactly what I said to the guy. Like I was really inflamed that he just thought like I'm some stoner. Yeah. Hey man. Two tires for well, that's what a cool fucking idea. Like fuck you, you know. So Urban Decay, I mean Urban Decay was ballsy. They called an eyeshadow twisted sister, yeah. right? So my second wife was in a Bloomingdale's, and she's in a she's in a Urban Decay. She's in a Sephora or something, and there's Urban Decay makeup. Yeah. And she's turning around, and sees a twisted sister. So she said, "Did you license this?" I said, "No." So I said, "Get me the phone. Get the woman." The, is there an Urban Decay person there? Yeah. She goes, hey, get her on the phone. I said, excuse me. I said, um, I see you have a makeup, Urban Decay. It's called Twisted Sister. I said, I own that name. I said, you have no right. I'm going to sue you. She goes, welcome to the club. We're being sued by Metallica, Judas Priest, ACDC. Like, they named every, <laughs> they, they stole everybody's names. Names. They stole everybody's names. Well, so and now I have to throw this out It gets out even you. better. Okay. It gets even better. <laughs> so we send the season and desist letter, and they go, and they go, we never heard of the name Twisted Sister, and I said, really? Because your makeup line is called Heavy Metal Saturday Night. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and, and so they were sued by everybody. Yeah. But you know those sons of bitches, they get away with it. Yeah. Because they just rescind it. They don't ever pay money. You know, like the, the best you can do is cease and desist. If you really want damages, yeah. you have to spend a lot of money, and there's no guarantee you're going to make your damages yeah. back. Right? But you were going to Well, say, I have to say, because now I don't know if you've seen this, and I don't know if you've licensed this. Are you aware of the ID channel, Investigation Discovery? You mean the Twisted Sister show? Show, yeah. yes. Okay. So right. here's what happens. <laughs> titles, book titles. Yes. There's almost nothing you can do. Okay. About. Like there's a band called Bad Company, a movie called Bad well, Company. Because if I could have helped you out and got yeah. you a few bucks, yeah. you know, I would have been no, more. No, but worse than that. My own freaking record label, Atlantic, owned by Warner Music, yeah. they had a cartoon, one of their cartoon characters, a VHS tape, and the episode was called Twisted Sister. And I call them up. I go, what the fuck? And they go, sue us. It's my own company. Sue us. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, 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 there's I, crazier yeah. stuff in the music business. There was a point in time, just so you know, that Jay Giles had to sue the Jay Giles band for touring without him. But that's <laughs> and not, he lost. <laughs> that's not that unusual. I know, but, no, but, that's, was, not, but that's, that's the crazy one yes. to me, is he lost. <laughs> yeah, but that's not that unusual because of because of ownership rights right. can be fuzzy. There's no fuzziness here. I own yeah. the trademark. But that's not a statement to hurt Mark or D or anybody right. else. First of all, forgetting Mark and D, let's talk about the original guys in the band. Those guys were nuts. And when they when the first two guys were fired, one for pulling out a gun and threatening to kill a band member, yeah. I'm sorry, you want you know reasonable that's ground for firing yeah. somebody. In Another a story snooper. in the book. Um, you know, so then... Then the remaining members bought that right out. Yeah. Then another guy stole the truck and smashed the equipment. You know, he. Yeah. then we got that. And it was down to me and Kenny, and Kenny left. And I said to Kenny, listen, I don't know what the future brings. I, I don't know D well enough. Like, it was, I said, I don't trust it. I don't want to get hurt. Yeah. I'm not going to hurt somebody. I never abused it, ever. It's not like I put another band together. I know the value of this band. I know who brings what into this band. I cherish that. I cherish the, um, the legitimacy. Yeah. Of the trademark. You know, AJ died and went out with Mark. We went out with, with Mike Portnoy. No one called it a cover band. Right. Okay? Right? It's important to understand. Right. Um, Judas Priest is now down to Rob and one other person? I think one of yeah. The bass player, I believe. I think so. Right? And then yeah, I know the drummer's changed. Many I know times, of course, both guitar KK is obviously gone. Glenn's got health to, problems. Okay. He shows up from time to time to play. <laughs> right. But that's, yeah. So you get Priest as Rob and Ian Hill, I believe, yeah. right? Now, they have a right to call it Judas Priest for sure. Uh, I don't know if I would do it with two people. Well, I, you know, it's you kind know. of like, and we've discussed this one, 
I've said out of respect, the band Leonard Skinner, there's one guy left, yeah, Gary right. Rossington. I feel just change the name to Skinner yeah. because it's showing the respect to the history of the band and it's showing respect to the people who aren't there by changing the name ever so slightly to a name that everybody calls them anyway. Excuse me, Dead and Company is a perfect right. example. Jerry's dead. Yeah. And, you know, they really respected the fact that Phil's not there. They're called right. Dead and Company because they can do all those songs and you love them and they're not selling something else. And I'm right. really careful. It's even like Judas it. Priest could just be priest. Yeah, they could. They could. <laughs> and but, people would get it. But I guess they have legal grounds to yeah. maintain. And the Beach Boys, you don't even know you're getting at the Beach Boys anymore because they're different. They have five different well, Beach Boys. Yes, I feel there's like two different versions of the band that exactly. stay on separate continents when they yeah. tour. Like they yeah. swear they have it coordinated. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, there's vitriol in those bands. There's no vitriol in Twisted yeah. Sister. Me, Mark, and Eddie talk every damn day. We are texting each other yeah. about a business deal. Right? I don't sit there and go, I do this, I do this. D's out there, D fights his own battles. He's out there making metal happen. And, yeah. and he's also one of the greatest front men in the world. And I love him dearly, and I wish him the best. And Mark does his thing, and you know, and, and Eddie does his thing, I do my thing. Should that thing coalesce into the band, it'll be called Twisted Sister. But until yeah. it coalesces in that way, it won't be. Because I don't think it's fair to the fans. And so that's my own perception of legitimacy. Okay, and anyway, the book describes what I did. I did it to protect myself. But you know what? I think it protected the image of the band. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm glad about? When the band came back, they got people got Twisted Sister. They didn't get a watered-down version. Right, absolutely. One, two guys. You know, it's always like a joke. Like, who's in your band? Well, the drummer's cousin's uh, nephew, <laughs> and then, you know, there's some tenuous connection. The roadie's brother's niece is the new guitar player. No. Yeah. You know, you want Eddie Ojeda, J.J. French, Mark Mendoza. I mean, look, A.J. is the drummer in the back. But AJ is AJ, and you know D once said the only way you're out of this band is if you die, you know. And <laughs> well, that was bad foreshadowing. You know, and he died, and then I said, "Too bad the nice guy died." You know, like I guess you could say about the Rolling Stones of Charlie Watts. You know, well, yeah, the nice guy died. You know, who doesn't love Charlie Watts? Oh, absolutely, you love him. And that was heartbreaking to hear that yeah, happen. Yeah. So anyway, look, the Stones will go out because. It's the Stones, and because they're the last vestige of Beetledom. I really think the Rolling Stones, I don't want to say they're capitalizing. They've got certainly enough money to do what they want to do. They don't have to work. Right. I guess they feel they need to, and if you're willing to spend the money, I always say, you know, you're not selling heroin to school kids. If people are buying it, be my guest. Uh, I have not seen them since 1975 and thought they were good. You know, I, I saw them with, you know, with Mick Taylor yeah. when they were majestic. Right. And we'll say, at their peak, they were, if not the single greatest rock and roll band ever, certainly among the top three yeah. uh, of, of live touring bands. The Beatles didn't really live tour, so we'll take those out of the equation. But you want to look at Led Zeppelin at their peak, and you want to look at the Stones at their peak. Um, man, they were fucking awesome bands, and I saw them at their peak. You know, That's the thing that kills me. Yeah. I saw them at their peak, and I was... I was inspired by them because of them. So when I see them and they're not at their peak, what I say to myself is, is Twisted Sister letting somebody down in the same way that I feel let down?